of Georgia. You had far-right forums, social media platforms spreading around the full names, the ages, the addresses of the 23 grand jurors in that Georgia case. It is being called a target list. How does someone like Donald Trump plant the seeds for that kind of behavior? Well, Trump is a chaos agent, and he welcomes violence, particularly violence that benefits him. So, of course, he's going to be going after the judges and anyone who can uh, harm him. And what he's doing when he issues the threats, like, you know, if you go after me, I'm coming after you, he's setting an example, something autocrats are very good at. He's giving others permission to uh, take his words and do what they must uh, in their minds. And indeed, this woman uh, who you know, threatened to uh, threaten the judge uh, said she's a kind of a leader cult follower. And she said, you know, if anybody goes after Trump, I'm going to kill them. And it's a very dangerous moment because he has groomed these people to uh, be his devoted followers. And when the leader is in distress, they become very volatile. And we saw this on January 6th. That was a cult leader rescue operation. He summoned the faithful. He was in distress. And they, you know, did their violent thing. And so we have now lone, lone, you know, rain, lone actors and others who are taking uh, the word seriously. But I want you to take a listen to what Georgia election official Gabriel Sterling said back in 2020, calling out Trump, calling out Republicans for their silence after election officials face death threats amid all of the election pushback. Take a listen. This is elections. This is the backbone of democracy. And all of you who have not said a damn word are complicit in this. Death threats, physical threats, intimidation. It's too much. It's not right. They've lost the moral high ground to claim that it is. Someone's going to get hurt. Someone's going to get shot. Someone's going to get killed. And it's not right. Clint, that was December 2020, one month before the January 6th attack on the Capitol. Talk us through why these threats against those trying to hold Trump accountable are still so relevant today and how institutions like the FBI are working to prevent actual violence from happening. Well, it's remarkable looking at the date of that. Uh, just a month later, we saw the January 6th insurrection, and there was you know, widespread violence on that day. Fast forward now, instead of seeing these sort of group mobilizations like we do in January 6th, what we see is what we call stochastic terrorism. We know what the target is. It might be jurors that's leaked online in Georgia. It could be a judge um, that's trying to case in Washington, D.C., but we don't know who the attackers are necessarily. Um, and I always worry that when we see these online threats, um, such as the one we were starting this segment off with, that under the surface, there is somebody that's taking a, a threat and actually executing it, but thinking about mobilizing, moving to those targets. And that's very difficult to defend against. Imagine, you know, going to Georgia, having to focus on 23 jurors, then going to D.C., trying to protect uh, a legal process there, another one in Florida. It can become very taxing and exhausting on law enforcement to coordinate all of those threats to try and detect them. And it's also just a lot of entities to protect over a long time. Remember, this is these trials are going to go on not just for months, but probably for years. You'll also have appeals, I would imagine, in one direction or another. This is a very, very long time. It's going to really put some stress on all of the law enforcement units in these areas, these jurisdictions, and particularly on the FBI to try and catch all the little pieces that might be clues of a potential uh, in-person attack that might surface against any one of these individuals. North, I don't have a lot of time left, but I do want to ask you, it strikes me there's a certain circularity to what we're watching out of Georgia, where you had election workers like Ruby Freeman and her daughter, Shea Moss, named in the Georgia indictment as victims for the threats they faced trying to count ballots in 2020. And now you have people who are just called to serve on a grand jury. They did their civic duty and they are facing the same type of threats. Yes, this impacts institutions. It also impacts individuals. And in doing that, it undermines the entire nature of our civic order and our democracy. That's, that's the end game. That's one of the end games, is to destabilize society. The, these people, and I'm including sitting lawmakers like Representative Matt Gates, who says we're only going to bring change to Washington through force. These are people who are continually inciting violence, and they want to uh, have a destabilization of society. They want people to be threatened, or they wouldn't be doing this. They're, they're making a choice, and it's quite astonishing 
that in a superpower, which only has two uh, major parties, one of those two parties, the sitting lawmakers are inciting violence practically on a daily basis.